everybody. Thank you for, for coming. <coughs> My name is Moritz Eisold, um, and I will be speaking about how we build Gitpod.io, um, an online IDE based on Eclipse Thea. Um, I'm a co-founder of Typefox. We build smart tools for, for smart people. And you may have seen us because of Gitpod, because we started the CR project together with Ericsson, or because many people <coughs> who work at Typefox also um, started the XX project. But before I go into the details of, um, of CR and Gitpod, I want to talk a little bit about why why did we why, why did we why did we start this project like at all? I mean, there are so many IDEs out there already, <clears throat> and it's got a bit to do with lessons learned that we um, from our work with the Eclipse IDE. I mean, we've been using the Eclipse IDE for the last 11, 12 years. It was a great time, um, but there are things that that didn't work so well for us, and I think for most. <clears throat> So, for example, one scenario that I come across again, uh, that I come across again and again, is like what happens in Eclipse when I want to change a Git branch. Like in Git, changing a branch takes milliseconds. It's like incredibly awesome. But when I do it in Eclipse, then um, I change a Git branch by doing a Git checkout, and then I do a full build, and then the full build takes like five minutes because the project is a little bit bigger, and um, then I realize, oh. Um, I'm on the wrong Java version on my machine, and <laughs> so <laughs> I need to fix the Java version. And then I do the full build again, and um, it looks good, but then I realize it doesn't compile because there are some dependencies missing. And then I update the target platform and do a full build again. <laughs> and um, yeah, maybe, 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 then, um, maybe then it's working. I see some laughter, so I guess I'm not the only one who ran into this way too often, and <clears throat> but there's another scenario, like what happens when I want to do a pull request review? Somebody, a colleague of mine is asking me to review a pull request because then I, I do a git checkout and um, then I realize, oh, um, no, I cannot, my workspace is occupied, I'm currently working on a feature, I have a lot of modified files in my workspace, so I need to stash them. And um, <clears throat> And then I go to one. <laughs> then I um, do a full build <laughs> on the pull request review. Um, then I realize, oh, I'm on the wrong Java version. So I fix my Java version. And I do a full build again. And I realize, oh, there's a dependency missing. <laughs> so I update my target platform and do a full build again. And then maybe two hours later, I can review the pull request. Um, <clears throat> another scenario is um, when I want to have help from a colleague like I have a little problem and a colleague is, has more expertise in that area. Um, maybe I create a tiny little example to be precise about what I want, um, push it to Git, and then message this other person like, hey, can you please look at my Git branch? And that means the other person, yeah, basically continues with Git checkout, and then the other person the person that I'm actually requesting help from realizes, oh, my workspace is occupied. I cannot look at this Git branch. Um, and then this other person <laughs> needs to do a Git stash and then um, do a full build and then realize, oh, I'm on the wrong Java version. <laughs> and then um, activate the right Java version, do a full build, um, and then realizes, yeah, oh, there's dependencies missing, and so on. Um, we are all software developers. Do you see the hotspot? Right. <coughs> Um, but there's more, another scenario, like I'm, I'm traveling, I'm on a train, or I'm on vacation, or I'm, um, I don't know, on my balcony, and I want to hack some code because it's fun, and I want to start the Eclipse IDE on my iPad, and I'm like, yeah, well, um, that's not going to happen, because I don't know how I could make this happen. Um, <coughs> so... Right, so there were things where that we were not so, so super happy with, and we thought about um, how can we do this differently. And first we addressed, uh, we wanted to address this setup, build, setup, setup thingy. <coughs> and um, 
there is a concept called dev environment as code that we very, very much like for this purpose. Um, think of infrastructure as code. I mean, if you are familiar with the dev DevOps or cloud native um, um, crowds, then their infrastructure as code is very, very popular. So it's the same idea, but applied to workspaces. Or when you think of the setup section in a readme, think of this, but executable. Or if you're familiar with Eclipse Oomph, um, that's the same idea, but we can, we can do it a bit faster than, than, Oomph, than Oomph can do. Um, but the basic idea is that <coughs> you describe your dev environment in code, put it under Git, so that all the changes of your dev environment are being tracked, and, um, and thereby it becomes easy to track changes, um, to handle branches, tags, um, and to share it across the team. And that has an interesting consequence on the effort because let's say you have a team of 10 people, you only need to set up the dev environment once and not for each person, not for each workstation. And Docker is a real, a real enabler here. Um, so we, with this we can really simplify the very core of this hotspot already. But that's not good enough. Like when we do a full build in Eclipse, I had it way too often that a full build takes three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, and I really don't wanna wait for it. And it's really easy to like full build starts and then you start, oh, well, it's gonna take long. I start, I don't know, checking emails, checking Twitter. So your flow is interrupted, it's terrible. We do not want to wait for full builds. So why not just let a server do it? Why not just um, pre-build the workspace? Um, <clears throat> it's not a new idea. It's the same idea that Jenkins and Travis and so on follow. So it's just what people do in continuous integration, except that in continuous integration you produce deliverables. And what we want as developers is workspaces. But we can use exactly the same idea to um, pre-build a workspace. So just think of like, um, if you do a git push, then the server gets notified and the server does a git clone and then runs your build, I don't know, Maven compile, download all the dependencies and then stores the pre-build. And when somebody later wants to open a workspace on that git branch, then there's already a pre-build and you can just open the pre-build and don't need to compile again. So we can get rid of full builds, or at least we can eliminate the need for, to wait for, for full builds. Um, <clears throat> then in the next scenario, um, review a pull request. We really should not, this is a symptom of occupied workspace. I find it very, very terrible. We, we should not need to, to deal with it. So why not, let's say you need a new workspace, just start another one. I mean, on our workspace, we typically only have one workspace, or maybe we put in the eff invested the effort to set up a second one. But in my experience, setting up a workspace locally is so much effort that you try really hard to avoid it. So let's make this easy. Um, need a new workspace, just start another one. Maybe even in parallel, so you can have like two, three, four workspaces running in parallel. That works well <coughs> because we're in the cloud and they're isolated from one another and you're done with your work, just forget about the workspace. Just um, yeah, forget about it, delete it, don't need to touch it again because for the next task that you're working on, you will be launching a new workspace anyway. And um, <coughs> I think that many issues that we, or many much time is wasted nowadays by trying to reuse your workspace. Having a workspace locally and putting a lot of effort into keeping it healthy keeping the setup correct. Excuse me. And um, <clears throat> launching new workspaces and having the available very, very quickly becomes easy because we have dev environment as code and because we have pre-builds. So these two concepts are true enablers here to, to have parallel, isolated and disposable workspaces. <coughs> um, Another scenario, um, sharing. I wanna share 
a workspace with somebody. I shouldn't need to push it to Git. I mean, I just want to give it to one person. I don't want to version control it. <coughs> Why not just um, take a snapshot from my workspace, have it have a URL that refers to the workspace, and then just send the URL um, to that person. And when the person clicks on that URL, the, URL, the person gets a, gets an exact copy of my workspace. And this way, <coughs> I don't need to push to Git, but more importantly, the other person <coughs> can focus on helping me. The other person is no longer bothered with Git checkout, finding the right Java version, fixing the target platform, running full builds, because it's just a wait of time and will probably prevent the other person from helping me. <coughs> so we can simplify this <coughs> and develop on the go, develop on an iPad, develop on a Chromebook, um, good thing is Eclipse here is based on web, te web technology, so it can run on an iPad, it can run on Chrome. So by using Eclipse here, we, we, can, we can use very mobile, very lightweight devices for actually developing. So it could be like an iPad, or it could be a tiny Chromebook, or it could be an affordable Chromebook with a super large screen. Um, but either way, the hardware that we carry around with us is light and not so expensive, but still our workspace has all the CPUs of a data center and it has the connectivity of a data center, so we can download Maven dependencies with hundreds of megabits. And so we get basically the, the best of two worlds. Um, <clears throat> so I think these concepts of dev environment as code, pre-built workspaces, parallel isolated and disposable workspaces and shareable workspaces are true enablers to do something better than what we have with the Eclipse IDE nowadays. And um, when thinking about it even more, I think that we have like three very, very central use cases in our daily life as a developer. <clears throat> like you choose a Git branch, you wanna start coding. You choose a pull request, you wanna run edit, comment, review it. You choose an issue and you wanna start coding on a new branch. And we want to make these three use cases incredibly quick and without friction. And that you can just do it and don't, don't need to think about setup and so on. <coughs> and now I wanna show a little bit how, how this can look like. So here I have a, um, a Chrome web browser and I have a Chrome extension installed. And this Chrome extension adds this GitHub button into my, onto the, the GitHub website. And when I click on this GitHub button, um, <coughs> um, a workspace or a GitHub will start a workspace for me. And oh, I'm on the wrong. this branch actually. <coughs> and um, so the URL from, from GitHub um, is just being prefixed with gitpod.io pound pound slash. And now we can see that gitpod on the server side is um, starting a Docker container. And <coughs> the Docker container is becoming my, my workspace. And then gitpod is starting um, Eclipse here inside this Docker container. And now we have um, all the sources from this project inside a workspace. So that is the Spring Pet Clinic, a Spring application example. And Gitpod has already not only checked out the sources, but they're also already compiled. And the example is running here on the right hand side in my preview. So I can click on find owner and I can see this is really, this is really the live, <coughs> um, the live example 
running, running in my workspace. Um, but let's look at, let's look a little bit at the details at how, <coughs> how we got so quickly from GitHub to a workspace in which my application is actually running. And um, what we have here is, um, I wanna show this piece by piece, <coughs> a little config file, the gitpod yaml file, um, which is basically the entry point for dev environment as code. So at the very beginning, we specify a Docker file, and we can look into this Docker file. And um, this Docker file, um, <coughs> when Gitpod finds such a Docker file, Gitpod will build it, and the resulting image will become your workspace. So here I'm using a, a default image, which already includes many support for many languages, and MySQL, and Gcloud, yes? Oh, yes. <clears throat> so we switch to the light scene and I can zoom in a little bit and I will close the preview and then you can see better. Um, thank you. Um, <coughs> so, and um, so we start from a, we could start from Debian, or we could start from Alpine, but for reasons of convenience, I started from a default image from Gitpod that already includes support for many languages and MySQL, and then I install a gcloud command and a docker command on top, and when I go <coughs> into the terminal, um, I can see that I have Docker available, and um, I can see um, <coughs> that I'm already connected to a Kubernetes cluster, and so that these tools are available, and that these tools are also configured <coughs> just the way I need them for, for development. Um, there is one, one more thing that I did here. Um, here in Gitpod, um, we have <coughs> environment variables, and I can specify environment variables in my profile, and they are accessible from within the workspace. So in the Gitpod YAML, I wrote a small script that uses the, accesses the environment variables and then logs in with my account. So I can, <coughs> in the spirit of dev environment as code, I can connect to the infrastructure that I may need to, um, for, for development. Um, <clears throat> but other things that, I do, that I'm doing here is um, the, the init command and, and this regular command. Uh, we can, <clears throat> that is something that Gitpod also has executed and we can see it here in the, in the terminal. And um, <coughs> first, Gitpod has executed um, this Maven package Docker file build thingy. And here we can see um, the Maven build has completed successfully. And later, Gitpod has executed um, this Java jar thingy. And here, the, that's what we can see down here. So the pet clinic started. And <coughs> the difference is um, the init command has been executed on git push. And um, so <coughs> it ran basically as CI. And this is what Gitpod tells us here, that um, everything above this message um, was executed offline and we didn't need to wait for it. And that's why we did not need to wait seven minutes for this pet clinic example to, to start. And that's how we as developers do not need to wait for full builds. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> then another thing that we can do here is um, we can specify which VS Code extensions should be installed in my workspace. But there's also a view for it, <clears throat> so I can just, <coughs> I can obtain a VSIX file from somewhere, like download it from GitHub or something, 
and then just drag and drop it into this view and then Git pod will add it to the list. And then the VS Code extension is running, running an Eclipse here. Um, <clears throat> I have a bunch pre-installed for Kubernetes and database support and Spring Boot tool support and so on. And on top of that, a few more <coughs> are pre-installed. Um, for example, the one for Java. So if I want to do some Java programming, um, I have the Java VS Code extension available, which uses the Eclipse JDT language server in the background. So I can, for example, just say, <coughs> if I trigger content assist, then I get the um, accurate content assist, just like we know it from Eclipse. Or if I hover over a message invocation, I get the Java doc. <coughs> and if I control click on it, I go to the declaration. And the, <coughs> the declaration even has source code, even though it's coming from a jar file. <coughs> so that all works, works really nicely. Um, what I can also do is um, <coughs> I can debug it, so I can set a breakpoint, go to the debug perspective, a uh, view, say debug, and okay, this is not working right now. <coughs> this is unfortunate. Sorry, it worked the last three times I tried this. Um, <coughs> so there's still a little bug involved, but in general we can we can debug this and um, stop in breakpoints and do step into the step out of see the threads, three the call stacks, and three three the see the variables. And um, <coughs> another thing I can show since we have the Spring Boot tools extension here installed. When I press um, okay. Uh, <coughs> that I can, for example, um, navigate my source code by symbols, and these are symbols that the Spring Boot um, extension contributed. So I can, for example, navigate my source code based on, on these get mappings. These, um, <coughs> this is how Spring Boot um, maps HTTP requests to um, the impl implementation that actually handles it. <coughs> what else can I show when I <coughs> when I modify something here? Um, I can see it in my Git view. So here I see this file has been modified. I can stash um, add it to my staging area, and I can I can commit it, and then I can go to the terminal, for example, and I can see that I I just made a commit. <laughs> And from here, I can also um, push it um, back to my repository if I want to. Um, <coughs> but maybe a bit interest, more interesting is <coughs> um, when I start um, from a pull request. So here I have um, a pull request from the Eclipse CR project. And I could press the Gitpod button. But I want to show that Gitpod actually um, besides Jenkins and Travis and Eclipse committer agreement, um, there is also Gitpod that gets notified when somebody updates the pull request. And this is how Gitpod will um, run a pre-build. So when I click on this now, then um, <coughs> Gitpod will open um, a new workspace for, for this pull request. <clears throat> Here we can see it's loading the pre-build right now, which is often a few, or it can easily become more than 100 megabytes. Um, <clears throat> and um, here again we see um, the pre-build saved us <clears throat> five minutes of waiting to compile here. And here on the left-hand side, I see all the changes from the pull request, <coughs> and can see the, can look at the diffs, 
And on the right hand side, I can see the conversation from the pull request. I can also see the inline conversation, like what people commented on, on individual lines. And um, I, can, I can review uh, the PR so I can approve it or reject it. And <coughs> since um, CR is already running, I can also open it in a, in a new browser window. So now what we are seeing is um, Eclipse CR, <coughs> which I launched from my Gitpod workspace. And when I now look at the files and I open some files, um, then we see here um, the breadcrumbs feature. So the PR that I opened um, is introducing this breadcrumbs feature to, to Thea. Um, so I can very easily just try the changes that are proposed by the, proposed by the PR. <coughs> I'm sorry? Yes. <coughs> yes. Um, <coughs> so Gitpod has started a new workspace, and in the workspace we started CR, so CR is running twice in the same workspace. <laughs> And this is the, I'm sorry? Yes, they are, they are the same. Yes, it's the same tree. All right. Um, <clears throat> all right, so much for, um, for the demo part. So now I'm gonna have a few more slides about um, um, about lessons that we learned while, while building this and also especially while operating this <coughs> um, that were very interesting lessons that we learned um, since like 10 years ago we started as tool developers and now we are actually hosting and operating an IDE which is a little bit different than, than building a tool. <coughs> so we learned things like Suddenly, people were asking for, for service level agreements, and we need to figure out um, <clears throat> what service level indicators should be used to, um, to monitor that Gitpod is actually running properly. And we decided on website avail avail availability, and we, <clears throat> um, we promise and we monitor that workspaces can start and that workspaces are reachable with an objective to be much more <coughs> available, much more than 99% of the time. And we learned that, <coughs> um, that redundancy and robustness is not only necessary, but very, very helpful. And um, <coughs> how we can use this in, in many, many layers in the architecture of, of our application. So Gitpod is running in three, in three regions and three geographical regions, so it's running in the US and in the EU and there's another cluster in Asia. And they all <coughs> are attached to the same load balancer. So if one region fails, then the other regions take over. So for example, if the region in the US fails completely, then users from the US will be routed to the to EU or to Asia. So that's the first level of fail safe. <coughs> then inside a region, we have multiple zones. One zone is physically a data center. I mean, this is how the big cloud providers organize their cloud infrastructure. So if one zone fails, then another zone will just take over. And we, as operators, don't need to do anything from, for it. And um, <clears throat> the next level below, um, thanks to Kubernetes, we have um, nodes and pods and also <coughs> Um, a node is like a typically a virtual machine. When such a virtual machine fails, then Kubernetes will make sure that another one will take over. And um, same with, with individual pods. Like when a pod fails, Kubernetes will make sure that another one will be started to, to take over the job. Um, <clears throat> which brings me to the next point. <laughs> um, here we see how many workspaces are running in, or were running in, in our EU cluster. Um, and we can see that, um, so this is monitoring data from, from two days, and we can see that during the day there is a lot of load, a lot of people were using it, 
but during the night, pretty much nobody was using it. I mean, people are sleeping. So what we <coughs> really wanted and needed here is the elasticity of a cloud. So we only want to run virtual machines that are just enough to handle this load. So when users come in, we need to launch more virtual machines. When users leave, we need to shut them down for the reasons of, um, <coughs> yeah, basically for the reasons of cost, cost efficiency. And <coughs> but there's more to it. So we learned that more users are um, better to reach a, ho a high density. Um, or when you have more users, it's easier to reach a high density because then you have less um, unused capacity on your nodes. <coughs> then we learned that we needed to have a smart, um, a smart scheduling algorithm. So the scheduling algorithm decides on which node a new workspace will be placed. <coughs> and the default, the default is a round robin algorithm. The problem with round robin algorithm is <coughs> that um, um, all running nodes will get fresh workspaces basically in a, in a fair matter, which means um, the nodes will never become empty, which means we cannot scale down. So um, this is something which did not work for us. So we built an algorithm that um, packages the workspaces so we can also quickly sc or scale down as quickly as possible. <clears throat> and we realized that um, I mean, we are giving to every workspace a certain amount of disk space and memory and CPU. Um, but statistically, people don't use all they could use. Um, so it works pretty well to, to overcommit a little bit and, and thereby increase um, cost efficiency. <coughs> then startup performance, of course, is a very, very important topic. Um, and we, we pre-pull Docker images, at least some, some of these images, so that you don't need to wait for, for a Docker pull. Um, <clears throat> but in general, I can, we learned that there are so many details that go into optimizing startup time that the only way to make it really performant is trace it, optimize it, repeat it, just <laughs> with good old profiling. Um, just keep, it's an ongoing process of monitoring, uh, tracing, and optimizing. <clears throat> then the next thing we needed to deal with was um, latency. So in Gitpod, I mean, we, we, we provide a terminal. <clears throat> and when people type in the terminal, every keystroke gets sent to the server. <clears throat> there it gets executed in the bash, running bash process. And the result gets sent back to the web browser. and um, as a user, I want that this feels snappy and it should feel like I'm developing locally because if it doesn't, then people just won't use Gitpod because it, <coughs> um, it feels bad. Same with content assist. When I press control space, then um, I, need, I want a quick content assist. And that is not so easy to realize with a cloud IDE um, because our planet Earth is pretty big and users come from many different locations. And um, the speed of electrons is not infinite. Um, so we actually have some latencies. So I measured this from, um, from our office in Kiel in Germany. And we can see that to, <coughs> to the Netherlands, for example, we have a latency of 29 milliseconds. But to Mumbai, for example, a latency of 408 milliseconds. Um, so, um, for a good user experience, the latency should be clearly below 100 milliseconds, um, which led us to, to the decision that we operate multiple clusters. At the moment, it's three, one in the US, one in Asia, one in Europe, so that no matter where you come from on this planet, um, you have a low latency access to your workspace. <coughs> then. Um, <clears throat> to run, um, to roll out updates. Um, we, uh, of course, <clears throat> we want to ship updates very often, but that only works when we can do it without interrupting the users, I mean, without maintenance downtime. 
So um, for Gitpod, the Kubernetes rolling update works very well for us. For SIA, we upgrade when people start new workspaces. So a running workspace is never, never touched with an update. <coughs> um, privacy regulations were something to consider, especially GDPR. Um, <coughs> of course, we had some, some bad actors. So if you can see um, this, can you see this? <coughs> um, there's one graph going up here. This is the CPU load in the EU cluster. and. There was one guy running a Bitcoin miner. Um, we detect this automatically and shut down the process and shut down the workspace, but sometimes people try out new miners that we still need to add to our detection algorithm. <coughs> so that's something we needed to deal with. <coughs> Another thing that was a very unpleasant surprise in the very early days of Gitpod, um, somebody figured out that they can run a DOS attack from, from Gitpod and sent about 16 terabytes of data to China, which put about 3,500 euros on our traffic invoice. Um, that was a little bit unpleasant, but we learned to block the right traffic and decide which traffic we can block, and if we do not block it, then at least um, lim limit it to reasonable amounts so that um, people cannot cause um, such unpleasant costs. Then security was a big topic, um, which is not trivial because it's not something that you can attach somehow or modularize somehow, but it requires you to have a very, very deep understanding of your architecture, your cloud infrastructure, your networking, um, Docker, the Linux kernel, and many more things. And if you don't understand this, then it's very likely or it's then you're more likely to make mistakes and forget attack vectors. Um, <clears throat> we did a lot of um, community support and professional support and um, SLA monitoring for this. And um, what helped us a lot was um, to have good logging and good tracing. I mean, <clears throat> as a toolsmith, usually when somebody reports a bug, they provide you an example on how to reproduce it and then you debug it and profile it and that's how it goes. But here with Gitpod, <coughs> very often we have scenarios, there's no way we can reproduce them um, because it's too complex and um, uh, the system is too large. So what we need is good logging and good tracing that explains to us what really happened so that we can, can learn from this. Um, here's an example from a trace. This is Jaeger tracing um, that helped us a lot. <coughs> this is basically um, a call, um, a call stack combined with a gum chart. And to come to an end, <coughs> I can say that today we, yeah, we operate um, gitpod.io. Uh, we also operate Gitpod Cloud, so it's like a dedicated installation of Gitpod under a custom domain. Can do custom branding, custom SEO, but type of can manage it. And we are just starting a private beta for self-hosted Gitpod, so that. People can install Gitpod on their private cloud or company hardware or laptop. Um, and um, we are working at the moment that people can install their own Thea or own version of Eclipse Thea on Gitpod.io. Um, GitLab support is pretty much finished. That's something we will release very, very soon that we can not only connect to GitHub but also to GitLab. Um, and we're working on Bitbucket and Jira support. All right, <coughs> that's so much from my side. Do we still have time for one or two questions or not so much? Not so much. Um, thank you for being here. I will be outside for a few more minutes and take questions there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.